If you remember at the Theatre of War Symposium, and some of you who, who weren't at the Theatre of War Symposium, it's all online, all the video, all the materials online. And we looked last year at how artists uh, work in conflict zone, in places where they had to look at resistance. Uh, and the primary motivation for myself in doing this was to try and imagine, although quite difficult and perhaps not even uh, the right exercise, try and imagine what it might have been like for our poets and our playwrights and our citizens, although they weren't citizens then, up in, operating in, in, in 1916. And I looked at, at uh, Professor Jay Binder's uh, kind of health warning around commemorations of the time, which was beware of national exceptionalism. In other words, uh, beware perhaps of that not necessarily 1916 or indeed the Easter Rising might not necessarily be the centre story of that year, however important and crucial it was uh, for our own emerging state. And of course, we looked at last year, uh, we had conversations with Patrick Coburn, we had conversations uh, with, with, uh, with my next uh, guest as well around what else happened in 1916, which is of course the creation of the sykes Pico line, uh, which then was kind of basically the Middle East was carved up in about, in about five minutes at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. And that has reverberations today. As we, we were looking at, broadly looking at the, uh, at the Middle East, we we're looking at other conflict, uh, conflict zones. So this section here uh, is about a continuation of that conversation. Um, and my next guest uh, needs no introduction in, in that he gave an extraordinary uh, narrative story, fact, fact, last year. He, Ray, Ray Dolphin is his name, he's an Irishman. Uh, he works for the United Nations and has for over 20 years. Uh, he is the world's leading authority on barriers and on settlements, uh, uh, and he gave an extraordinary talk last year on the fragmentation of the West Bank. We invite him back this year, um, to not to make his debut this time, but you know he's come back by, by popular demand, to use our showbiz terms, to talk uh, about uh, uh, Gaza and uh, looking to the future uh, and perhaps predicting what might indeed happen in Gaza. So please welcome Mr. Ray Dolphin. Um, good afternoon. Thanks very much, Fiek, for inviting me um, back this year. What I'm going to talk about today is that um, I'm going to talk about Gaza in, Gaza in 2020, a livable place. Um, I noticed that the, the quotation mark dropped off the, in the program, so it's actually... The, the, the basis of this is that in 2012, four years ago, um, in, in Palestine, we got all the UN agencies to get together and looking at the situation in Gaza in 2012 and projecting it forward to 2020 to see if the Gaza Strip would actually be livable. And that was quite an exercise. It's very difficult to get UN agencies to work together. We got WHO, which is the look at health, uh, UNICEF, the children's organization, to look at education. And even more difficult or even more surprising, we actually came up with a, a report which people can actually read, which is also not very common for UN agencies. And I've left copies um, outside in the foyer, so, and it's a very short report, so please feel free to to, to uh, t take copies. So the question is, will the Gaza Strip be livable in the year 2020 based on the concerns in 2012 and projecting them forward? And we're in 2016 now, so we're halfway through that eight-year cycle, so it's probably a good time to revise the look at the report and see where we are. Um, be perhaps before I do that, I'll um, <coughs> just to uh, some orientation of where is the Gaza Strip? If oh, it's working good, Google Earth. <coughs> Just to orientate you, um, last year I talked about the fragmentation of the West Bank, how it's divided by various physical and bureaucratic measures, and you can see the Gaza Strip down here in the here it is here. And the first thing you'll see, of course, it, it is also fragmented. It's se separated from the West Bank by Israel. So any movement of persons or goods has to go through Israel and has to go with the approval of, of Israel. Now the Gaza Strip, Gaza itself is a very old city, but the Gaza Strip only came into existence in 1948 at the end of the first Arab-Israeli war. The population then was um, something like 60,000, 
And then in 1948, we had 200,000 refugees who flooded in, either expelled from what became Israel or fleeing, fleeing the fighting. And they never expected to be there 70 years later. They are their descendants, but that's the situation. In 1967, the Gaza Strip was captured by Israel, <coughs> and Israel controlled the Gaza Strip still controls the Gaza Strip, but until 2005, when in what's called the disengagement, Israel removed all the settlements in Gaza, withdrew from Gaza, and according to the government of Israel, um, the Gaza Strip is no longer occupied. Now, that's not this, the position of the international community, because if we look at the Gaza Strip, Israel controls all the, it's, there's, a, it's a fence, there's a fence around it, there are crossings which are controlled by Israel, Israel controls the airspace, and Israel also controls any approach by sea. And currently, Gaza fishermen cannot go beyond six nautical miles. They're stopped by the, or fired at by the Israeli Navy if they go beyond that. So because Israel controls all the crossings, except for one here, which is controlled by Egypt, um, we still consider uh, Israel as the occupying power, even though if they're not physically present in the Gaza Strip at the moment. Um, and then the other important days in 2007 when the um, Hamas took over the, the Gaza Strip. So Hamas has been in control of Gaza since 2007. So to add to the territorial fragmentation, we now have two. We have Hamas controlling the Gaza Strip and we have the Palestinian Authority controlling parts of the West Bank. So we, we have to add a political fragmentation to the territorial fragmentation. How large is Gaza? Um, it's 360 square kilometers. For the purpose of this, I Googled to see how big Louth was, the county Loud, which, as we know, is the smallest county in Ireland. And that's 826 square kilometers. So Gaza is about half the size of Louth. But perhaps to, to give you an idea of how small it is, in the UN, we used to we, we organize a marathon in Gaza. And it used to start here. And when you reach the Egyptian border, you'd run exactly the length of a marathon, which is 42 kilometers. So it's the only territory, territory in the world, I believe, where if you run the length of a marathon, you've actually run the full length of the territory. As you can see, it's much narrower. It's only six kilometers wide uh, here and maybe 14 kilometers wide at the bottom. That's 360 square kilometers. And since the Hamas takeover in 2007, Israel has imposed a blockade. And what it means is that goods entering Gaza are very limited. There's a dual use list, and Israel has a list of goods which they say can have military purposes, and they don't allow in or they restrict the, the passage in. Exports are extremely limited. Gaza used to export furniture and crops, particularly to Israel, and that's almost come to a complete halt. And the reason for the, the economy and other indicators were so bad, that's why we decided to do this report in 2002. So if we look at the, I'll just move on to the next one. Um, I won't talk about the whole report. These are just some of the, the uh, main conclusions. So if we look at population first, the population in 2012 was 1.6 million. Today, it's 1.9 million. And the projection is that it will be 2.1 or 2.2 million by the year uh, 2020 in four years' time. And that may, it's already one of the most densely populated places in the world. And by then, the population <coughs> density will go up to 4,500 per square kilometre to something like 6,000. Um, uh, health and education, these are concerns. Um, but what I'm, I want to concentrate on, particularly as the economy, um, housing, and then finally look at the water situation, which is actually the most critical issue in Gaza today. Now, we didn't make any um, predictions about the economy because there's been so, because of the blockade and because there's so much conflict in Gaza, it, it was felt that it was, wasn't possible to predict what the situation would be like in 2020, with good reason. But already there in 2012, the G GDP, which is what economists use to measure that national health or per capita GDP was already less than it was in the 1990s. Um, and I think, again, that's the only country in the world where in the 2010, 2012, the, the economies are actually worse than 20 years before. And that has got considerably worse, as we'll see. And then we look at housing. Now, why has the economy got so bad? Um, 
That's a photograph we took in 2012. That's the southern Gaza border with Egypt. You can see the, the uh, that's the border there. Egypt's there. When the border was withdrawn after the Camp David Agreement, for some reason, part of the city of Rafa was left on the Egyptian side. Um, and what you have there is, you have houses there, as you can see. Here, what we have, these are buildings, and what they're concealing is tunnels. Because following the Israeli restrictions, what happened was that people in Gaza, they dug hundreds, actually more, at one point it was apparently 2,000 tunnels going under the border with Egypt here, and the tunnel openings or endings were in these houses here, and then they were concealed on the Gaza side under tarp tarpaulin and what you can see there. And what were the tunnels used for? They were used to smuggle into Gaza any goods which were prohibited or restricted by the Israeli authorities. And the main smuggling was for construction materials. Now, Israel limits construction materials through the legitimate crossing because they say Hamas or Islamic Jihad or the other uh, armed groups could use them to build tunnels. Not these type of tunnels, but what Israel calls terror tunnels or military tunnels going into Israel, which in fact were used during the last war in Gaza. However, of course, all that happened was with these tunnels here, all the construction material was smuggled in, and so Hamas got the building materials anyway, so it didn't do much good. It was also used to um, smuggle in fuel, which is allowed by Israel, but it's much cheaper in, in, from Egypt, where it's state subsidized. But all sorts of things were, were smuggled in. I remember there's a zoo in Khan Yunus, and I remember speaking to the zookeeper a few years ago, and he'd got new lion cubs, and they had been smuggled through the tunnels. And he was talking about getting an elephant um, and talking about designing a, a tunnel large enough to take an elephant through. Now, the elephant didn't turn up, um, but, for example, four-wheel drives, which were prohibited for security reasons, something in 2010, something like 11,000 four-wheel drives were smuggled in through the tunnel. And you can even go on YouTube, some enterprising person from Rafa ordered Kentucky Fried Chicken from somewhere in Egypt, and that was smuggled through the tunnels. A little bit cold by the time it arrived. But just to show you the extent of the smuggling that was going on. Um, but it was what kept Gaza going between 2007 and 2013. Literally an underground economy which was tolerated by Egypt, of course, lots of money was passing hands, and also tolerated by Israel effectively, I think in, for the reason to push um, Gaza Strip away from the West Bank and into the arms of Israel. And Hamas were making a lot of money from the tunnels. Somewhere here, there was a giant weighing scales, and all trucks that came through had to drive over and they were weighed, and then Hamas would impose taxes or tariffs on them. And it was a major, that was a major part of of how Hamas kept the economy going, or kept its civil service and, and military going. Now, in 2013, as you know, um, we, uh, General Sisi, now President Sisi, came to power in, Israel, in Egypt, and he overthrew President Morsi. And that's led to big changes in the relationship between Egypt and Gaza. The, um, the, the current... Egyptian regime, President Morsi, they have a big problem with the um, Muslim Brotherhood, and of course Hamas are part of the international Muslim Brotherhood, so relations are very bad. And what's happened is the Egyptian authorities have destroyed most of the tunnels on this side of the border. And not only that, but in the last year they've destroyed all these houses, all these houses are gone. And something like 3,200 families on the Egyptian side have been forcibly, forcibly removed down to other parts of Egypt, which is something that's not getting any interna international attention whatsoever. In addition, what they're doing now is they're building effectively, like we have in front of us, they're building this gigantic moat here to, um, on the, just on the, this side here, to prevent any reopening of the tunnels. And that's actually flooding houses on this side of the border as well. We actually have a this week, we, we have an international team going down to check out the, the damage there. So effectively, the economy in Gaza, the, with construction and the tunnel economy providing the main impetus, that's come to a, an end in the last two, two years since um, President, President Sisi took power. And effectively, what we have is we've got two blockades in Gaza now. We've got the continuing Israeli one with some restrictions, and now we have the, 
this Egyptian blockade. What the Egyptians have also done is they've closed their crossing point, the Rafa crossing point, Effectively, since, since October 2014, it's, it's been closed. And we have something like 25,000 people in Gaza registered to go through the crossing who, who are blocked, including something like 3,500 serious medical cases. So clearly, the economy is in a much worse um, situation now in 2016 than was envisaged even by the worst case projections back four years ago. The other, uh, let me go back a bit. The other major development in the last few years is we in, we've had three major wars in Gaza since 2008, the end of 2008, and the one in July, August 2014 was the most severe one since 1967, actually. Um, this is a neighborhood in northern Gaza called Sheikh Jair, and this is an aerial photograph taken before the war. If you look both at the buildings and also at the agricultural Thing. And this is a photograph taken after, as you can see, it's been completely devastated, both the, 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 the infrastructure and also the agricultural holdings. Um, dur during the war, there was, according to our statistics, there were something like 2,200 Gazans killed, of whom 1,500 were civilians. And we have a database of something, something like 150 families whose home, houses were struck by missile, missiles, and at least three family members were killed in, in the event, and that, that actually accounts for about half of the, the casualties. Now, beca because part of the, I know the theme here is to try and s to tell stories, I just want to give some, some, some sort of human face to that, to that statistic. I, I know this, this is Jamil here, who I used to work with, first time I went to Gaza 20 years ago. And during the war, um, I'll just go back, he invited his brother to stay in a house near him because he thought it would be safer. And then one day, one evening, the house was struck by a missile. And I'll go back. Uh, this next one. Um, so that's Jamil's nephew there. Um, He's the only surviving member of his family, his two parents, his six sisters, his sister's uh, child, and also his cousin uh, were killed. And the only reason that Jamil's nephew there survived is he wasn't in the house at the time. So all te 10 family members were actually killed. Just to give you some indications and put a human face on, on the destruction then. Um, this is a photograph actually we, we took last week. During the, the war in 2014, based on the two previous conflicts, we had assumed that the most IDPs, internationally displaced persons, we'd have about 50,000 maximum. In fact, we had 50,000 during the first week, and at the end of the war, we had 500,000 people who were internally displaced, mostly staying in schools. Now, a year and a half later, most of the these houses haven't been reconstructed. We still got about 95,000 people who are homeless, partly because of the problems of getting reconstruction materials into Gaza, but also we've got problems with funding and also problems between Hamas and the, the authorities in the West Bank. The result is that we're now going through a second winter and the majority of these people are still homeless, or some of them are actually living in their homes. Although 18,000 homes were either completely destroyed are so severely damaged that they are considered un uninhabitable. And that's the major issue at the moment. Going back to the 2012 report, we inv was something like 71,000 new houses were needed. But if we add the 18,000 that were dis totally destroyed and something like 150,000 that suffered some damage, clearly the housing shelter situation is, is very much worse than was envisaged four years ago. And I'll just conclude with have we lost the... Oh, it's back. Okay. Just going back to the report, I've left water till last, and that's because that actually is the most critical situation in Gaza. Um, there are no rivers or lakes or streams in Gaza. It totally depends on rainwater and possibly as part of the whole global weather changing. We, we haven't had much rain the last few years. Now, Gaza has an aquifer, 
It sits on the coastal aquifer. It's the only reason it can actually support 1.8 million people at the moment. But the problem is, because the water has been extracted much faster than it's been replenished, the sea has been infiltrating into the aquifer for at least the last two decades. It's actually impossible. It's so salty, the water in Gaza. In any case, the World Health Organization recommends that you shouldn't drink the water in Gaza, 90% because of the infiltration of chlorides and nitrates, which are, which are way over the officially recommended safety level. Now, if, we, if, you, if you can see that, what we were saying in 2012 with, was that the aquifer would be unusable by 2016, which is this year, and then that this infiltration of seawater would be irreversible by the year 2020. I was in Gaza last week and actually met with the head of the coastal water aquifer, and I asked him, I said I was coming here next week to speak, and I asked him how relevant are these statistics um, at the moment, and he said, Actually, according to him, he would say now that 97%, not 90% of the water is unusable without being some either boiled or desalinated for, um, first. Regarding this year of 2016, he said he put it at 2017. There are some water desalination plants, not major ones, but that has delayed it by a year, according to him. What we're actually looking to do is to, to, to build a giant desal water seawater de desalination plant, which is very expensive, but there is a proposal to do it, but it hasn't moved beyond the drawing board. Drawing board. So, according to him, this to 2020, the fact that the aquifer, the projection that will be uh, irreversible, is still, is still valid. So, unless in the next four years we address the water situation in Gaza, then I'm afraid we can, as in the program, we'll have to drop the question mark from the the Gaza uh, an unlivable place and actually say that in four years Gaza will not be livable. Thank you very much.